Hey everybody, it's Lon Seib and it's time once again for your weekly wrap up. And this week I thought I would talk a little bit more about live streaming, specifically live streaming in the workplace. We're now in kind of a hybrid work environment where some people are working at home, some people are on site. And now with all these new ways of doing things, we discovered there's ways to connect all of our different locations together uh, through a hybrid meeting format. And I thought I would talk today about some of the things I've been recommending to people to do when their boss asks them to host a live stream. Let's get to it. Now I do get emails from time to time asking me if I do consulting work and I largely don't do consulting work except on very rare occasions for friends and family. In fact, I just got done helping out my prior workplace with a hybrid town meeting that they did the other day. And my goal is to get them set up in a way that they don't need me anymore to continue doing this. I've set up now probably about a half dozen of these. Uh, some of them have been in the workplace. Some of them have been for one-off events like graduations and whatnot. And I've also helped a few houses of worship near me also have hybrid services. And I found the setup I'm gonna talk about today largely works for all of those instances. Now you do have to ask the question about what kind of audience are you going to be serving with this? In most cases, I have discovered that even though people want to do Facebook and YouTube, the reality is their audience is usually invited to this meeting or stream. And therefore, you don't need to go through the rigmarole of connecting up a Facebook account or a YouTube account. You can use something that I think is a lot simpler and a lot less prone to the copyright bots taking you down, which is Zoom. So why do I like Zoom so much? Well, the reason is, is that out of all of the different platforms that I've been playing around with, it is the simplest on both ends of the connection. It is simple for the person doing the meeting, but it's also simple for the participants on the other side. But they've got all of these dials you can turn uh, under the surface if you really wanna get in there and start customizing things. But I think for most people, it's a turnkey solution and it works well across the board. I have used Google Meet, I have used Jitsi Meet, which is a free solution. I have tried Microsoft Teams and nothing beats Zoom at this point, even though you do have to pay for it. We'll get into pricing in a second. There's a very easy scheduling system built into it. They will maintain the RSVP list. They will email all of your participants. They send out reminders because a lot of times people forget to log in. So everything is just kind of managed for you and it's just another item you can take off your plate as you're trying to put one of these things together. This is the big one is that at this point, everyone has likely been on a Zoom call at this point and people know how to use it. I have found even the least tech savvy people in my life prefer Zoom over everything else. They find it really easy to get into their meetings because most of the time it's just a tap on a link and it loads the app up and they're in. I'm not always crazy about email links loading apps up, but in this case, it gets your people into the meeting and you don't have to spend a lot of time ahead of it troubleshooting issues. Nine times out of 10, it's gonna work when people click on that link to go into it. This is a big one because Audio is often the biggest problem you run into. And if you leave everything on the automatic setting, Zoom does a great job managing audio levels, reducing echo, getting rid of background noise. It's just magic sometimes, for me at least, as to how good this works and how little time I'm spending managing audio on a Zoom feed versus something I might do on YouTube or Facebook that has less of these automatic audio controls. Now the production minded folks out there will cringe at this, but again, my goal here is to get people set up and walk away with them having the tools now to go do one of these streams whenever they want without having to pay me or anyone else. And I think for that purpose, uh, Zoom does quite well at audio management, but you can also get in and turn some dials and make it a more manual process if you want. Now, Zoom still has a free tier. You can't record your meetings with it and they restrict you to only 40 minutes of meeting time. But if you're looking for something quick and easy for a quick meeting, that's probably worth trying out before you go ahead and pay for it. I have a friend of mine who insists on only the free tier because he likes that 40 minute time limit. His philosophy is that if the meeting needs to take longer than 40 minutes, they're not ready to meet yet. 
so he uses this as a way of keeping things buttoned down from an efficiency standpoint. Most people I know have the pro plan, uh, which allows you to record your meetings and has a few less restrictions versus the free tier. But if you've noticed that on some Zoom calls, the video quality of the sender is better than what you've seen on your own Zoom account, that's likely due to the fact that they have a business or enterprise version of the Zoom license that allows for 1080p video. You will see in the Zoom settings the option to enable HD at all levels of Zoom, but the HD on the Pro plan is only a highly compressed 720p. If you want the higher quality 1080p that'll be closer uh, to what you might get on a YouTube stream, you got to go for the business account to get that quality level. Now, I do have friends that do more structured events like religious services and other large meetings. And for those, I recommend that they go for the Zoom webinar option. This is a very structured and controlled way to do a Zoom because the only people who can talk are the people that the meeting host elevated onto the virtual stage. Everyone else logging in is automatically an audience member and I think the most they can do is do the chat room, but nothing more than that. So this prevents all of the accidental unmutings that go on during a meeting, and it allows you to be able to present uninterrupted and only bring in audience members when the time is appropriate. And of course, you can pick those audience members out individually. The hand raising stuff, all of those little features still work here, so you can very easily find those folks, but it's a lot easier, I think, to manage a webinar for a large group versus the regular meeting format. The webinars cost a little bit more versus the standard meetings, but if it makes your life easier, sometimes it's worth paying a little bit more to get that efficiency. So let's talk about the hardware that I recommend for these things. Now, if you're just sitting at a desk, you don't need more than a decent webcam. Uh, the webcams that I like are the Logitech cameras. I use an older version of the C920 on the right-hand side of the screen there. Uh, I've had that camera now for over 10 years and it looks great compared to even modern webcams on modern laptops. They also have the Brio, which is a 4K camera, which I reviewed a year or two ago if you want slightly better quality. But more often than not, when I get the call about helping out with one of these meetings, it's because they've got somebody who's presenting to an in-person audience who's up on the stage. They've got a PowerPoint presentation along with that speaking part and they want to take both of those components and send it out over the stream so other people can see it. And that's where you really have to start loading up on some gear. Now, the first thing I recommend is finding a camcorder that has two important features. One is that it needs a microphone input. The second is that it has a clean HDMI out. And what I mean by that is that when the camera is outputting its video over its HDMI port, you're not gonna get all of this extra stuff here that you can see on the onboard display. So right now I've got my audio levels popping here. I've got how much time is left on my cards. You don't want any of that extra stuff going out over the feed. You just want what the camera sees going out the feed. And unfortunately, a lot of camcorders don't support a clean HDMI out. So you want to ask the seller of the camera whether or not the camera has this feature because it's really important for this to work correctly. And then of course the microphone input is another feature that you don't often find on inexpensive camcorders. But there are some out there that have both of these features and unfortunately due to supply chain issues and the fact that camcorders have not really been in that much demand at the lower end of the market, it means that you might have to spend a little bit more these days for a more robust camera, even if you don't need all of its features. So one camera that I have that I use here on the channel is the uh, Canon XA40 or 45. This one does the clean HDMI out. It also has some really nice balanced audio inputs, two of them here on the camera, but it also allows you to plug in just a three and a half millimeter uh, microphone into this also. And a lot of cameras that you'll find will have the three and a half millimeter microphone input, which will work with the microphone system I'm going to talk about in a second. Now, audio, of course, is just as important, if not more important than the video. 
So you need to do your homework a few weeks out to make sure you understand the audio environment you're walking into. How many people are speaking? Do you need to swap out mics? Is there an audio system at the venue already that you can tap into? More often than not, if there is a church or a synagogue or a mosque where there's microphones, there is an audio board somewhere, and plugging into that audio board is going to save you a lot of headaches because otherwise you're gonna to have to run separate mics everywhere. But if you've already got mics that are tuned for that location, plugging into their board is the best way to go. Now, sometimes you get lucky. The event I helped with last week was in a smaller room that was very quiet, and the on-camera mic here worked fine. I didn't have to mic anybody. I didn't need to run any additional audio cables. We just took the natural audio of the room and piped it through the camera. Is it good enough for a very small live stream over Zoom? Yes, probably wouldn't fly for a more commercial kind of event, but if it works, don't overcomplicate things, and the audience could hear very clearly, and Zoom managed all the levels, surprisingly, even for people that were speaking very low. Now, if you do need to set up external microphones, there's a lot emerging on the market to simplify this. We looked at this the other day called the DJI mic, and you can find the video uh, for this in my uh, playlist. And this is a two microphone system. These are wireless microphones with a built-in transmitter, but they also allow you to plug in external microphones. And you could even do something where if the audio board at the church you're setting up at isn't near where the camera is, you can plug the audio board into the transmitter and send the audio wirelessly back to the camera. The receiver unit here plugs in with a three and a half millimeter adapter to the camera, so it should support most consumer cameras out there. And it's a real plug and play solution. It even works with smartphones. And there's a few other products like this out in the marketplace that I haven't looked at yet. So I think Rode has something similar, but this is a great way to go uh, if you want something that works as a clip-on mic, but also has other possibilities with its wireless microphone input. Now, if you're going to be doing a PowerPoint on site, I would suggest having two computers. One of those computers should be designated as the Zoom controller. And I would also suggest that you have a single person assigned to operate the Zoom itself because you will have people trying to get into the meeting that have to be let in. You're also going to have people that might accidentally unmute their mics and have to be remuted. You also might be running the webinar version and need to bring people up on stage. And I think having somebody dedicated just to the Zoom part will really help things go a lot more smoothly. Also, if you're doing a hybrid meeting where people in the audience might want to hear from somebody on the Zoom, then you can run an HDMI output from the Zoom computer to a display, and then you'll be able to project people on the Zoom call back out to the audience. And again, Zoom is really good at muting audio when, when necessary to prevent echoing uh, back in. So definitely dedicate a computer for Zoom, and even better if you can dedicate a person to operate that computer. As far as specs are concerned, I found that any recent, you know, last two or three years uh, computer running with an i5 or a Ryzen 5 or an Apple M1 will be more than adequate to handle the Zoom task. So you don't need anything terribly powerful for this. If you get into a more advanced video production environment, you'll need a lot more horsepower, but this Zoom stuff doesn't require a lot of expensive computing uh, devices to make it work. Now the second computer is going to be running the PowerPoint or Keynote that's going to be presented to the audience. And you do need to get two HDMI outputs out of that computer. One of them has to go to the display locally at the venue, and the other one has to get into your stream. And there's a couple of different ways to do that. If your computer has multiple HDMI outputs, you can just do a mirrored output and have one of those go to the streaming system and another one go out to the monitor. You could also make it even simpler by getting just a simple HDMI splitter. So you plug in the output here and then you've got two outputs on the other side that will send the same signal out to two different places. 
you can buy one of these splitters with, I think, like up to four or maybe even more uh, HDMI outputs that will really make this a lot simpler to uh, get set up, especially if you don't have a lot of tech savvy people. It's just one in, two out here, and you are good to go. Now, how do you get all of this stuff into the computer? Well, I recommend the ATEM Mini line of professional video switchers. This is the entry level model that I have up on screen right now. I have the extreme version here, which looks a little intimidating, but works in the same way. And what the ATEM Mini lets you do is bring in four different HDMI sources, and you can output those over USB as a webcam back to the Zoom computer. So the computer sees this video switcher not as some expensive piece of video production hardware, but rather as a simple webcam. So anything you've got plugged into the back here can be brought into the Zoom presentation without having to do anything other than push a button here as you go about your production. And you don't need a computer to operate this. There are some features that you can make use of with a computer, but once you get it set up, it will boot up to this default state every time and all the person has to do on site is push buttons. So it's really simple to get working. Let's take a look at the process here. So step one is to connect my camera here to the back of the ATEM. So I've got my HDMI output coming from my camera. And what I'm gonna do here is just plug it into port one here on the back and that correlates with button one on the ATEM switcher. The next thing I'm going to do is take the USB cable coming out of the back of the ATEM and plug it into the USB port on the front of my computer here. And because this shows up as a webcam, uh, once I start my video, it's just gonna work. It works like a webcam. Now, one thing you'll notice here right now is that it is mirrored. So we do have to go into our video settings here. We're going to enable HD and we're also going to turn off mirror the video to get uh, the right angle. And now we've got our camcorder here on a Zoom call. And then I can also have the ATEM send audio from the camera into the Zoom as well. So if you just have a one camera thing going on here, you're done. Uh, but what I also have hooked up here on the second input is my computer. So if I push the second button here and we go back to my other view, you can see that as I push button one, we go to the camera. And as I push button two, we go over to the PowerPoint. And so now you don't need to have this crazy thing where you gotta click share your screen and wait for everybody to see it. You can switch on the fly here to get the person speaking and then cut to their PowerPoint. They even have some other stuff here where you can do a picture in picture effect. I've got uh, the fancier one here with my fancier ATEM, but you can move this around to different positions. And so you can do some overlays and other things that you can't do easily with Zoom, and you can very quickly switch back and forth between two different things. And because even the entry level ATEM has four inputs, you can have four different things coming into it and very easily switch between those things with just a button push, provided you get your cable management under control here. And this is so easy for a volunteer to operate because all you have to do is train them to turn the thing on, make sure everything is plugged into the right ports, and then it's just button pushes to get back and forth between things. Yes, there's more depth to the product than this, and we've covered it in my review, but for most instances, a simple switch between different camera positions is all you really need. Now, what about recording the event? Well, the easiest way to get the recording done is to use Zoom's recording feature. And this will record the entire meeting, not just what you have produced locally. So if you are having people participate remotely, this will capture what they're doing in addition to what your ATEM is sending out. If you wanted to just record the ATEM's output, it gets a little more complicated. Now, one thing you could get is an HDMI recording device. These are standalone devices. You can plug it into the HDMI output on your ATEM Mini and record that way. You'll get a very nice clean feed out of the ATEM doing that. 
Uh, Black Magic makes these things. Atomos is another company that makes some really high quality recorders. They can be a bit expensive. There are some cheaper ones out there, but I haven't found one that is reliable enough for me to recommend as something that is mission critical foolproof. So you might want to look at the Black Magic option for that. You could also run the HDMI out to a capture device and record on a third computer to be safe. Uh, there's also an ATEM Mini Pro, uh, which has recording capabilities if you plug a hard drive into its USB port. But when you plug a hard drive into the USB port, you lose the webcam functionality, which added a lot of simplicity to this workflow. So you would need to get an HDMI capture device for your computer running Zoom in order to record locally on that ATEM and still broadcast out via Zoom. Now I have here on the desk the more expensive ATEM Mini Extreme, and what this one has are two USB ports. So right now, this USB cable is for the webcam feature, but I have another USB port here I could plug a hard drive in for recording. So that might ultimately be the way to go if you need a really good local recording in the simplest way possible. In fact, all you have to do is click the record button and it just starts recording for you without the need for a computer or any other kind of capture device. Now, what we did today was something as simple as possible with the least amount of complexity. Basically, you train people to plug things into the right port and you push buttons and you're done. If you need to go beyond that, uh, that's when you're getting into more heavy duty production software. I like vMix. I've been using vMix now for the last two or three years. And this is what I use to produce videos here on the channel, but it's also very good at live streaming and very good at just running a live event. So check out my video called vMix from scratch, where we start with nothing and layer in a whole bunch of stuff so you can see the power of this software. But you can also see how this might be very complex for a volunteer at a church to use. And that's why I have recommended this ATEM setup on at least a half a dozen occasions, and everyone who's been using it has been very happy with it. And that's because this Blackmagic device is not a computer, it's an appliance. It boots up and it works the same every time, and it's very easy for non-technical people to get it working. Now, I am sure a lot of you have your own suggestions, which I look forward to reading down in the comments section, because there's more than one right way to do this. And I have found if the audience is happy, then it's a success. But again, let me know how you're accomplishing some of these things down in the comment stream. Now, this week's wrap up is being brought to you as always by all of you. And we have some super chatters to thank first, Chris Allegretta and Clean937 Samuel, who contributed on a recent live stream that we did. We also have two new supporters on the channel. Jonathan Gunter contributed via my donor box page and Bruce Balzowski signed up via the YouTube membership program. And I want to thank everyone who contributed this week and everyone who's been contributing on an ongoing basis and all of you who watch on a regular basis too, because all of those things equal channel growth. Now, if you want to help the channel, you can. You can go to lon.tv support and make a monthly or a one-time contribution via my donor box page. My fan is going off on that mini PC over there. We also support the YouTube membership program, Floatplane, and Patreon. I've got a bunch of other channels you can follow me on here, including my Amazon page at lon.tv slash Amazon shop. There you'll find a lot of my review videos completely ad free. We have a bunch of ways to engage with the channel. I've been doing a weekly email, which you can subscribe to at lon.tv slash email. What you'll get every Sunday morning is a digest of all of the videos that I posted over the last week. And then I also have a daily digest email that on the other six days of the week, you'll get a basically a compendium of all of the blog posts that I made throughout the day, along with whatever new videos that I posted. And I've got about 120 subscribed to that one right now, and you're welcome to sign up as well. Anytime you want to get off, just click the unsubscribe button. We also have the Facebook group and the Discord, along with the Telegram channel, which you can find at the links you see on screen here. Now, we also have a store where I sell previously reviewed items at prices lower than new. You can find the store at lon.tv store, but I also have a separate email alert that I use every time I add something new to the store, which you can find at lon.tv store alert. And I've got a bunch of stuff on there right now, including uh, some Game Boy things that I purchased at an estate auction. So check it out. 
And again, subscribe to the email so you can be notified every time we add something new. And that is going to do it for this week's weekly wrap up. I actually did this as a blog post the other day and I thought it might make a good topic because I'm getting a lot of calls from friends saying that their bosses are looking to do a live stream. So I thought perhaps this might be helpful to some of you out there as well. Again, let me know your comments down there and we will be back again in the near future with another review video, which I hope to have up by Wednesday. That is going to do it for now. Until next time, this is Lon Sivan. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Jim Tannis and Tom Albrecht, Hot Sauce and Video Games and Eric's Variety Channel, Brian Parker and Frank Goldman, Amda Brown and Matt Zagaya, and Chris Allegretta. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.